Testing, testing. Settle down, Pam. Testing. <laughs> Calm down, Pam. No running in the sanctuary. Unless it's the Holy Ghost or a child. A little bit. It's high time, right? It's remaining. One minute remaining. Let's praise the Lord. We've got a new song today. Um, it's called Jehovah. <laughs> I feel like I'm just talking to, talking straight to Jack and Pam. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just want to praise him today. He shames every idol. He reigns without rival. He goes by the name of Jehovah, Jehovah. He speaks into nothing, and darkness goes running. He goes by the name of Jehovah, Jehovah.
fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meet your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meet your needs. Notice, but <laughs> Nick Nick is over here making adjustments and then like on the equipment and then stopping to play the chords. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. It was so good. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Everything. 
our testimony. Have you ever been through a storm? We've all been through storms. 
We've all been through storms, and he always sees us through. Amen? He always sees us through. It doesn't always look like what we think it's going to look like. But his promise to us is that he'll always be with us even until the end of the age. He'll always see us through. He'll complete the good works that he started in us. When we take a step, he takes two. We take a step, he takes two. We step back, he catches us. <laughs> and he brings us, he keeps us moving. Hallelujah. Rain came, winds blew, but my house was built on you. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And I'm going to make it through.
God. You've been so good to us.
Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> We're so blessed that he calls us friend. We give you all the praise and all our worship. You're worthy of it all, Lord Jesus. You can be seated. Um, a couple of announcements today, which I don't have handouts for, but um, February 2nd, it's a Friday coming up. I will have some handouts to go out next week for this. We are having what I am calling a praise collective <laughs> here at the church. Um, and we are just going to get together and sing and praise God um, on that night. We're going to have some snacks. I'll have some more details for you next week. But, you know, invite a friend and plan on coming. We're just going to have some fun praising the Lord. Also, ladies, we are going to have a Galentine's Day brunch again. I was going to try to do an overnight, but it's coming up too quick. So we're just going to um, try to do a brunch again maybe the last Saturday in February. So, again, I'll have some more details um, for you on that next week. If you're watching online and you would like to sow into this ministry, you can make a check out to Growing Together Church and mail it to 11198 Emil Avenue, Northeast Hartville, Ohio, 44632. Or you can go to our website at growingtogetherchurch.squarespace.com. We have a secure giving link there and in the comments section of the live stream. I think that's all I got. Well done. Thanks for leading us in worship. <laughs> How's everybody this morning? Good. Blessed? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice atmosphere in here, amen. amen? It always is when we're really giving him the glory that he's due. He's an awesome God. He's still the same. He's still the same one that opened the sea when there seemed to be no way at all. Nothing's impossible for him. I've prepared to uh, share with you some things that God ministers to me and has been um, for quite some time, and especially lately. And... Um, it's from the Word of God, and it's alive. So I have a, an alive word for you. It's able to quicken. It's able to infuse you with courage and faith. And I've got uh, plenty of scriptures, and I really am trusting God to um, help me get this thing in gear. Um, I did title this message, There Are No Setbacks in God. There's only setups for what he has for you, your prosperity. And um, that's big talk, but that's something that came directly from God to me. And it's in his word, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk us through this. Uh, thank you, Father God, for this morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share the things that you've shared with me and that you've put in your written word and that you speak to our hearts, uh, the things that we need to hear from you, keep us focused and to keep us in faith, to keep the right attitude and the right thinking, uh, leave no room for the enemy to infiltrate. We thank you for your peace that guards our minds and our hearts and especially the times that we need it the most. I thank you for always being there for me. In Jesus' name, amen. So, <clears throat> I want to read to you a couple of scriptures. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for me to know which one to launch from because there's, there's such harmony in so much of the Word of God that um, I kind of have to read them in pairs sometimes just to... Uh, bear witness to the principle. It, it helps keep the word balanced because you're pulling from at least two witnesses from Scripture. So one is from Romans 8.28, which you all are going to be very familiar with. And the other of the two that we'll, I think, start with is Isaiah 46.9 and 10. So um, 
Romans 8, 28 should be a life verse for all of us. And um, I pray that it is for you. It's, it's a really powerful statement of faith. It says, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That is a powerful statement of faith if you truly believe that. To say that I know that even the things that look like it's a disappointment, maybe um, something that you've been waiting for to happen for years, maybe something you've been working towards, and it seems to fall through, maybe for the second, third, fourth time, you guys follow what I'm saying? It's happened to all of us on some level, right? And you have feelings of disappointment or you have feelings of maybe this isn't meant to work out. Um, you know, all kinds of feelings are involved, all kinds of thoughts, right? But this is such a powerful statement, and this is going to sound elemental, you know, elementary, but I mean it to be as raw and as plain as I'm going to say it to you. I'm really, God has me in a place where I'm believing this to be true, where I know this to be true. It's so powerful to me because one of the most special ways that I appreciate this understanding is when things are hard when things are difficult, when things seem to be a disappointment. Um, God reminds me of this, that he is working in the situation and nothing is impossible for him. So any situation, you guys might have to help me out a little bit more than usual. Um, there's only a few of us here, so I don't want to just feel like I'm talking to an empty room. If if it be appropriate, and what I'm saying from the living word of God bears witness with your spirit, go ahead and praise him with me. This is a worshipful time if you want it to be. Um, again, I just, I think it's too often that we read these things in God's word, and it's too familiar. Let me say it like this. I know that all things, God is working all things to my good because I am one who is called to his purposes and I love him. You guys hear what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's this statement made personal to me. That's this, that's this statement made personal to you. And as I said, God is causing me to be in a place where I believe this to be true. That puts courage in you, if you'll allow it. It, it really puts courage in you. Um, and there's many, many examples, and we're going to read some things in Scripture this morning that bear witness to this, um, that there are people that went through really harsh, uh, really hard things, more difficult than we've ever faced in our lifetime, some of us. You know, some may be listening over the internet. We, you know, we don't know who all our internet friends are. There may be some of you that are going through an extremely hard time. Or maybe you faced some significant disappointments in your life. And uh, the enemy has tempted you to lose heart. Uh, maybe tempted you with depression. And it's hard to get up in the morning because of so many disappointments or letdowns or... Um, people that were supposed to come through for you didn't, or, you, you know, you, the, the list is huge. There's all kinds of things that happen in life that seem to be against you, amen? It's just, sometimes it seems like that, but scripture tells us to know that all things work to the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 is a powerful word. I, I just... 
this scripture keeps chasing me down. And just, it's in me. I don't know if it's chasing me down. I don't know how to say it. God keeps reminding me of this. I think it's actually not chasing me down, but rather the Holy Ghost reminds me. It's, in, it's actually engrafted in me already. <laughs> so it's constantly with me. It's not chasing me down. And James says it's the engrafted word. It's the word that we have allowed to literally be planted deeply in the soil of our hearts that's able to bring freedom to our soul, our soul, where we think, where we feel, you know, emotions, where we make decisions. That's your soul. So how many of you know if transformation comes by the renewing of your mind, your mind is a very important thing. God wants us to understand these things and to remodel the way we think about situations and life. So Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I love how powerful this is. And we did, I don't know, some 18 weeks talking about believing God. And this was one of our core scriptures throughout so much of that. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He says, I declare the outcome, the end, from the beginning. And we see this played out so many times in Scripture, it's... Once God caused me to understand more about this, this principle and this truth, it has opened up the scriptures so much to me like never before. Now, I want you to follow along with me to Genesis 37. Because um, it always helps to have an example of someone who lived out a principle, that someone who um, was faced with adversity and God caused them to overcome it, not just overcome the adversity, but actually prosper and advance even in the face of disappointments, persecution, tribulation, tight places, hard, harsh circumstances, people coming against them, and to come through victorious. And that always builds me up, and it always gives me the opportunity to be infused with courage for my own life. Amen? And one of those stories, one of those examples, is a young man named Joseph. I don't know how much I'm going to read of this, but I'm going to read a, a good bit of it just to set the, um, the context of everything. I can't even tell you how many times I've read this stuff. And it's alive to me. Um, this, this section of scripture and the things that God has taught me through the life of Joseph is just profound. It's really profound. And so it's very special to me. So when I share it to you this morning, it's really alive to me, and I want it to be alive to you. Give God opportunity to, to uh, build you up this morning. And so we're just going to start with um, reading through chapter 37. <coughs> And uh, it says in verse 1, And Jacob dwelled in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now it helps if you know the backstory of how Jacob got tricked by his uncle. He loved Rachel, but his uncle connivingly put Rachel's sister Leah in the wedding bed at night, unbeknownst to Jacob, and he woke up with someone who was not actually his his intended bride, and so he was tricked, and through the competition of the two wives, he ended up marrying Rachel, the one that he really loved, 
and through competition of wanting more babies to cause Joseph to love the one more than the other, they each gave him a handmaid, so he's got four wives, and so that's why we've got all this drama amongst the sons, because then now we've got favoritism for one, because it was the first son of his original wife that he wanted, not the one that he was tricked to marry, and it, was, it came later in his life, that's why it says the son of his old age, and he only had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, from that wife. So I think I did all right with that. So that's the backstory. story. Um, and uh, in verse 4, I think we left off, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream. Here it comes, guys. And he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. He said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, because it was from God. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And being... And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Now, for the young people that are in the room, when he's saying they made obeisance to my sheaf, that's King James' word for, like, basically they bowed down and gave honor to his sheaf. So it's like saying God is showing me that you guys are going to bow down and give me honor. And it was a prophetic dream. You guys following along with me? Okay. It's good. Amen. <laughs> Everybody awake? <laughs> Amen. And so, verse 8, And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more. Why does it say? They, why did they hate him more? For his dreams. And for his words, uh, it's a fact that, and it's an unfortunate fact, it's a reality. When God blesses someone, and it's perceived by those who already their hearts aren't in the right place, maybe there's jealousy, envy, which in this case is true, it causes hatred to rise up because the enemy wants to turn the situation against you when God has given you a future, an expectation, a dream, whatever you, uh, whatever form he shows you, he wants to, the adversary wants to turn the situation against you and throw it down. You guys follow what I'm saying? And it's over and over again in the scriptures. And he dreamed yet another dream in verse 9, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars have made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, his brethren went to feed the fl father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee to them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer dreameth, this dreamer cometh. Behold now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. This is, I believe this is the hand of God in the situation, as crazy as it's about to get. Listen to this. I believe God influenced the heart of Reuben. 
he heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. In other words, uh, Reuben is saying this stuff to spare his brother's life because I believe God touched his heart to stop this madness, to kill their own brother. And it's saying that he had plans in his mind after they put him in the pit while they're off doing something else, keeping the flocks. He's going to go back to the pit and pull him out and save his life. I believe that's God. And I believe that God influenced Reuben's heart because God had already spoke a future and an end for Joseph. And he was going to bring it to pass no matter what. Okay, so we see God in the midst, keeping it from going off course, right? Nevertheless, this is a bad situation. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, and they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content." I believe here again, now his brother Judah, having compassion and having what I believe God influencing his heart to also, besides Reuben, spare his brother and come up with a plan that will appease the envy and the hatred, the murderous hatred of the rest of them and sell him into the hands of the slave sellers, the Midianites. And uh, where did I leave off? What verse? 28. And then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. So here's Reuben. He's coming to do his plan where he must have been watching uh, what his brethren were up to. Maybe he saw that they had come away from the pit and he was going to do his plan where he was going to pull them out of the pit and save his life. He was not aware that they sold him to the slaves and returned unto his brethren, and the child is not, and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a goat of the kid, of the kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood and they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it is thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down to the grave under my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, captain of the guard. Now I want to do a couple of things real quick. I want to take a break from reading that. Thank you, Jesus. Now, right before it turned the new year, I brought a message to you guys, and there's a couple verses from that that I'm, I want to read to you. Um, you know, Joseph's father, he's stricken with grief over something that's actually a lie of the enemy. And I talked about that with you guys a couple of weeks ago. 
you know, here's this bloody coat. And it was presumptuous of him. I mean, it's logical that he came to that conclusion, and that's what his brothers wanted him to come to the conclusion that instead of it being revealed what hurtful and nasty thing they did to betray their brother, they'd rather it be safe for them to get off uh, from being blamed for it and to have their father believe that he was dead. And so that's what they did. And I believe that was from the enemy, right? Uh, the enemy motivates with envy. The enemy motivates with murder and violence. The enemy motivates people to do wrong things. We all know this in some form, right? However, in light of the scriptures that we read to launch this message today, there are no setbacks in God. There's only setups for the outcome that he proclaimed, that he spoke the end before the beginning. This thing is working to the good of this family, even in spite of the enemy's hand in the midst. You guys follow what I'm saying? Now, because probably all of us are familiar enough with this story, we already know the outcome, which is probably the only reason I can even teach it this way. Psalms 105. I want to look in there real quick. I really like it because it brings light to it's like a um, a little excerpt of what how God's hand was in this thing. Psalms 105, 16 through 22. I want to read from that. Listen to this excerpt. Because we know Joseph is heading into Egypt, right? And if you understand the story, there's already going to be, at some point, prophesied a famine over the land, all the land. And God is aware of this. And it says in Psalms 105, verse 16, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a slave, sold for a servant. He was sold for a slave. Whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron until the time that his word came, that is, the word of God came manifest. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him and the ruler of the people and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. I want to read that verse 17 one more time. It says that God, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. What is so clear to me is that even though the hand of the enemy was influencing the minds of his brothers to wipe out the dream that God gave Joseph. It all played into and worked to the good and worked towards God's plan. His ultimate plan was to send someone into Egypt, which was Joseph, and it said he sent Joseph. So even the enemy's attempts to snuff out God's purposes for your life will never work. Because when God speaks, he's going to have the outcome that he speaks because all of creation obeys the word of God. You guys following what I'm saying? These are some of the things that God has shown me. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we believe God at his word, not because we see it, we see the evidence of it. You guys following what I'm saying? It also talks about how we believe by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. He spoke, and the stars now exist and burn and bring light, the sun being one, and the earth, and he caused it to tilt at such a perfect uh, angle. <laughs> they say, if it was so many decimals of a degree off from the way it's tilted now, the way that God set the foundation of the earth, 
it wouldn't even be able to sustain life the way it does. God spoke, thing, spoke things into existence. Why that's important to understand is because when God speaks over your life, he commands the outcome to be what he said it would be because every element in this universe obeys the voice of God. Now, I don't understand how that works. I don't. I don't understand how every element just obeys the voice of God, but I know that it does. You guys follow what I'm saying? So that same principle works the same for you and for me. God's promises that he speaks over your life as you receive that by faith. And Joseph received that dream as a word from the Lord. And because he repeated it twice, he confirmed to him. He was saying, this is surely how it is going to be in your life. But it was only a glimpse of the outcome. You guys follow what I'm saying? It was a very clear glimpse that there would be honor, that there would be something of an honoring of his family to him, right? But he's not given any details of how it's going to come to pass. And so it can make it very difficult for us when we have an expectation of something that we're believing God for and everything goes haywire after he speaks. Are you guys at least willing to meet me there? I know experientially what some of this feels like. I'm believing God for some things, and I have, I am fully persuaded of what he told me. You guys follow what I'm saying? I'm fully persuaded of what he told me. It's going to be as he says it is. But in the meantime, there are things that happen that take place. Sometimes the enemy tries to hinder it, right? Like they said, you know, We'll kill him, and then we'll see what happens of, to his dreams. The enemy wanted to kill the purposes of God in and through Joseph by killing Joseph. But his point is, and his objective is, to kill God's purposes. You guys follow what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm gonna be <laughs> I'll be able to minister to pastors that that teach to only 10 people someday, I'm going to say be encouraged. Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, uh, it seems so quiet in here. It's like I could hear a church mouse. But I know that the things that I'm saying are so powerful. Um, for instance, I'll give you a for instance. Um, God is working on me to not let situations get in my head. I'll give you a for instance. God has already shown me, and there's nothing wrong with me sharing this particular thing with you, I don't believe. God's already shown me in a vision stadiums and auditoriums with thousands of people. With the full knowledge knowing that I would be there and be a part of it. And he's furthermore assured me that I will be and this is not something I ever asked him for or something I wanted, but it's an expectation. Joseph never asked him for the dreams. He never talks about how, you know, it was simply the plan of God. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to do something in your life, right? And he comes and he makes covenants with men and with women. He makes covenants with us according to the purposes. So he came down, he wanted to make a people through which his son would come through, so he made a covenant with Abraham. He said, your seed's going to be like the sand of the seashores, like the stars of the sky. If you could number them all, that's what it's going to be like. And he comes down and he says these amazing, he releases these incredible, almost impossible to believe promises to people just like you and me. That's how he works. I mean, he's just teaching me. I'm not going to change how God works. He doesn't adapt how he works for you and me, for our opinion. You know, <laughs> he's not, Job, there's a part of Job that says, which one of you has brought him counsel that he owes you for that wisdom? You know what I'm saying? I'm paraphrasing. Which one of us could tell God how to run things better? You guys follow what I'm saying? So this is how God works. Is this blessing you? I mean, it's just, I know some of these things I've taught before, but it's worth going through this because people, I need this word. That's why he's causing me to understand it this way. So when I look out here and I see, I, I see the reality of how it is right now. 
And maybe there's not some amazing, incredible move of the Holy Ghost in the midst right at the moment, and there's not, uh, you know, miracles necessarily occurring right now, although I, you know, I know God can uh, send his word forth, uh, just like for the centurion, you know, so I don't, I don't doubt that that could be happening right now, but I don't see it. You guys follow what I'm saying? But the expectation that he puts, just like in Joseph's heart, this is, I have great honor in a, in a position where I'm going to put you, and it's going to be an incredible responsibility. It's going to be uh, a position of, of great prosperity. Amen? And so he does that. He, he speaks these incredible promises. And then here on the earth, we have an adversary working to hinder it, working continually to destroy it working as hard as he can with all the subtlety that he can muster to snuff it out. So he wanted to destroy Joseph's dreams. Why? Because it was God's purposes and God's plans, right? And so, but through that, (laughs) the ultimate wisdom of God, it helps to understand two things. I know I'm all over the place, but God, he'll help me. (laughs) <laughs> I hope it's ministering to you. Is it making sense to you, sweetheart? Mm-hmm. So praise God. Praise God for my wife smiling at me in the front row. Um, you know, you got to remember God is sovereign. He's on the throne, and he's always been on the throne. He will always be on the throne, and there's no one even beside him. We read that. There's no one even beside, there's no one even at his level, not even close. He says, I'm God, there is none like me. Everything else and everybody else is created by his very word. We wouldn't even have breath in our lungs except he breathed into Adam and started the whole thing and put seed in his loins, right? And made a, and made a woman from his rib wouldn't even exist right so he is the he is not just the beginning he is forever god he's elohim (laughs) elohim he's always existed he exists he's god all by himself so he's sovereign he not only has all power but he has all authority he's all authoritative so when he speaks all of the universe again i'm saying this for the third time probably all of the universe, every element has to come in line with what God spoke. You guys follow what I'm saying? So when he speaks his promises, that will be the outcome. So everything that the enemy is trying in Joseph's life, and he will use people that are not in the right frame of mind. You guys follow what I'm saying? And God forbid that it would be you or me. But sometimes it is. And when we recognize, hey, I'm being used by the enemy, I'm thinking the enemy's thoughts, I'm thinking unforgiveness against someone, we've got to consider that's not from God, amen? That's not righteous, that's not, that's not what he wants for us, right? He wants us to love one another and forgive, and that's, that's what keeps this thing right, okay? <laughs> that's the only way you're ever going to have healthy relationships in your life, is if you monitor your own thought life towards other people, Amen? And towards yourself. you got to love yourself. You're made special. God has a destiny for each one of us. Amen? But you got to remember God is sovereign. That's going to help. Now, if he's sovereign and he's all loving, and he knows you intimately, and he has the very best in mind for you, then that means he is able to bring it to pass. You guys follow what I'm saying? You just meet me here. This is what's called faith. Because I can't see God. But I know from his word, and I believe him for who he says he is. And even besides that, I have life experience now that has caused me to be able to trust him more. You guys follow what I'm saying? I know he is who he says he is. And I know in my heart, I believe him for the outcome. You know, he's spoken to me about my family. He's given me promises about my family. That's why I don't stay up at night worrying about my children. He says, they're mine. You guys follow? I'm just giving you some examples. I'm not up here bragging. Please, 
Don't misunderstand. I'm just showing you what it, what it can do when you believe God, what it can do in a heart when you really are fully persuaded that what God told you, he's going to bring it to pass. He's going to even turn the situations that the enemy meant for evil to turn it to good. You guys follow what I'm saying? Is it making sense to you, young David? Is it good? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I told the kids, I, I was joking with them this morning. I said, I know I got a few texts and we got, you know, uh, some families that couldn't be here. I said, well, I don't know how many of us are going to be here. I might need uh, amen from Esther, a hallelujah from David, and a glory from Mama. And I said, but don't do it mockingly. I said, I was just joking with you. You don't have to say a word. But, you know, I knew I was going to have a small crowd this morning. But nevertheless, see, what I've determined to do, and I, I know God honors it, I determined in my heart to not be discouraged by anything adverse to uh, what seems to be adverse to our situation. You guys follow what I'm saying? I choose to be expectant to see God uh, even work the situation to the good, um, to be encouraged in him. David says, it says in the Bible, David encouraged himself in the Lord. So I focus on the things just like Joseph had to when he was off, sent off with a murderous crew of brothers to a foreign land. We don't even know if he necessarily even knew the language yet. He may not even be able to understand the slave traders. We don't, we don't know how hard it was for him to hear his brothers talk about killing him while he's crying out for help in the pit and them talking about, well, we can sell him as a slave. We don't know what it was like to try and get out of bed in the morning after being sold as a slave thinking his life was just trash. You guys follow what I'm saying? I mean, just meet me here because he's a real human being. He still had feelings like you and me right? Just like the New Testament says, Elijah was a man just like you or I, subject to like passions. When the evil queen wrote a letter and said, God, do to me even worse if you're not dead by the end of the day tomorrow. And she was a witch, a witch queen. <laughs> uh, these people were just like you and I. They're human beings subject to feelings. So I'm sure there was times where the enemy was coming and tempting Joseph to be discouraged. You guys follow what I'm saying? What God told me is there's no setbacks in him. Being sent to Egypt was not even a setback to Joseph, according to what God says. You guys follow what I'm saying? Because he's working it to the good. And that's a mind-boggling, bizarre thing, because how could it possibly be good to be sold, hated, rejected by your family, sold off into a foreign country? How could you? It's not possible for the natural man to, to really muster up the good feelings of, hey, man, this is really working out. I mean, you know, somebody might think you're a little bit insane if you were talking like that. You know, if you were just totally numb to the reality of what's happening, hey, man, this is really working out. This is absolutely heading in the direction that I thought it was going to. Really. I mean, it really looks good. It feels good. You know what I'm saying? I'm being a little bit, um, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, you get, you get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> it's, it's not certainly looking like it's heading in the right direction. But I want to read the first verse of uh, Genesis 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Here's what I really want to read, verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. God even caused this man that he never even met Joseph before to see that God was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house and all that he had put in his hand. I love that it said that Jehovah was with him in the situation. 
that's another thing that I want to talk to you about, is that God will never leave you or forsake you in any situation. Amen? That's your cue, Esther. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you. And it says he's a prosperous man. And I want to share with you, and I've shared this. This is not a new concept. Because I've shared with you the definition of this word prosperous. It literally means to rush, to advance, to prosper. Watch this, to make progress. To succeed. Now, in... <laughs> In whose book but God's is being sold as a slave, rejected by your family. Now your life is owned by a stranger that can do practically whatever his will would be with you. Work you as hard as he wanted to work you out in the fields, whatever he wanted to do. Feed you whatever he wanted to feed you or not feed you. In whose book is that being successful and moving forward and progressing through life? But... <laughs> But see, God's plans, they don't make sense to the natural man. You have to have faith. You have to be fully persuaded that God is sovereign, that he has his plans in mind for you, and he's going to bring it to pass. You guys follow what I'm saying? In other words, this is what I believe kept Joseph through all of this nonsense, this craziness. And what God is, what God would do if we'll let him is he will cause us to understand things from the perspective of faith, or rather, his perspective. You guys follow what I'm saying? There are no setbacks in God. So, as we experience things that tempt us to feel let down, and don't seem to match up with what we thought, how things were going to go. This word that God speaks is meant to give you courage, is meant to help keep our attitudes right, is meant to help give us a positive outlook on the situation so that we don't lose heart. And one of the scriptures that I had read to you guys was from Galatians chapter 6. I read it to you a couple weeks ago, and I want to revisit it. Yeah, it's Galatians chapter 6. And I'm going to read at least like 7 through 9. That's what I'm going to read. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall also reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And here's the one that I want to get to. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What the enemy wants to do, this is really his main influence is to get us to doubt God. To doubt what God said, to get focused on what things look or feel like currently and convince us that that is the focus rather than what God said. You guys follow what I'm saying? And in doing so, if we allow him to do that to us, you'll become faint and you'll become weary. There's a tiredness. I've literally experienced this. It's no better described than in Scripture right here. It's a weariness. It's sometimes, um, sometimes he'll, he'll bring a spirit of heaviness about a situation because he can you see he if he can get us to lose focus on what God said and believing God and being fully persuaded that he's working things out to the good we can get in this rut you know kind of get in a rut you know I've got a tractor in the rut it's hard to get out of the rut especially if you got a load of wood on the wagon and you're trying to pull out of the rut and the tire's just spinning, and you just seem like, man, okay. You're bogged down. You're not making progress. You guys follow what I'm saying? 
it's the same in life sometimes. And, you know, you got to get out of the rut. So you do what you got to do to get out of the rut, whether it's shoving sticks down in the rut or shoveling out a little bit of area to get it, you know, get the get tire, get traction. You got to get traction back on track. And I believe that's a mindset. For us in life, it's getting the right mindset. And that's why I say to you, God says to you today, there are no setbacks in him. It really is hinged on us trusting him with our life. Amen? As one of the scriptures that I had in mind this morning as well, I told you I had a lot of them. I wonder if I copied and pasted it. Yes, I did. I love this scripture. There's others too. Psalm 37. This is a scripture that God was reminding me of. I'll read it to you guys here in just a moment. There's so many promises in the word of God. I dare you to go through the Psalms. David went through a lot of things too, you know. And he wrote a lot of encouraging, very raw and real uh, songs that he sang and he wrote by the Spirit of God. This is one of the Psalms. In Psalms 37, 3 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This is, this is one of the key ones right here that I'm about to read. Verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Amen? It doesn't get much better than this, guys. <laughs> I don't know what to do to arouse some faith in the house this morning. He says, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and the judgment as the noonday. God is teaching me there are no setbacks in him. It's our job to commit our way to him. It's our job to trust him with our life. That is not always an easy thing to do. It's easier said than done, right? But when you have a made-up mind and you understand the love that God has for you and for me, you understand his sovereignty, we understand that our relationship to him is that we are his children and he is our father and he loves us and he knows exactly what we need to be provided and that he has already promised to do that. When we enter into that, we enter into a relationship of trust of giving and receiving love, of being fully persuaded that he is who he said he is and what he says he's going to do, he's certainly going to do it. And even the things that come at us that seem harsh or a disappointment, he is well able and he is indeed working them to our good as we love him and we are a called according to his purposes. Is that a good wrap up, Pam? Does that get it all in there? Because I... I don't know how else I could say it. Maybe I wouldn't even remember how to say it the same way again. <laughs> Be encouraged. Can I tell you one more time? I, I, I want to tell you, I know that this is true. It doesn't mean that I don't struggle from time to time because the enemy can be very convincing sometimes. You know, he's, in a sense, I talked to you guys about this right before the turn of the year. Just how, you know, the brothers presented the coat, the bloody coat to the father. The enemy does similar with us. He'll present us with what looks really awful and terrible. And it's a lie. He's saying, look, what thing, look at how things are going. He presents us with this mess. And we jump to conclusions. He's counting on us thinking the worst. And he'll help you along with that train of thought. You guys follow what I'm saying? But the truth is, Joseph's not dead. He couldn't possibly be dead because God had already promised in the form of two dreams what God was about to do. Jacob just lost focus. You guys follow what I'm saying? And we understand why he lost focus and he lost that, lost hold of what 
should have been a keeping promise. You guys follow what I'm saying? And the enemy is wily like that. And the reason I want to share it to you like that is because then you can be aware. When you're tempted to be discouraged about a situation, you'll remember this message. You'll remember the example of these men's lives. You'll remember how the enemy has a playbook and he's just running plays on you. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) He's just trying to run a play on you to see if you'll catch on to it and, and, and believe his lie and become tired, become heavy, get stuck in a rut of wrong thinking, lose track of the promises of God, get out of that rut. Remember that God is well able and he is working it to the good. And he's not going to have his purposes thwarted ever. Because all of creation obeys the word of God. So these things that he's spoken, these promises that he has written down for you and I, take hold fast of them and don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Amen? I refuse to believe any other report but what God said to me. Period. I don't give it up for anybody. You guys follow what I'm saying? It's a good message. may not have been the most eloquently provided to you, but I'm glad you guys were actively listening. And I pray that you're encouraged. Amen? I pray that those of our internet friends, those of you that couldn't make it in today, I know it's nasty weather. I know some people uh, are sick today, but I pray God blesses you, and I pray you recover. I pray that you get rest. I pray that you still have some nice family time today, some downtime from work. I hope um, that you get rested up and that we see you again soon. God bless you. Uh, I want to tell you there are no setbacks in God. That's what he told me. In fact, to be accurate, <laughs> what he told me is there's no setbacks, there's only setups. He's setting us up just like even though it looked crazy for Joseph, God was setting him up for total success in the thing that he had established already. Amen. You guys get the message, you get the concept, you get the principle, you get the promise, you get the courage, you get the faith, you feel the love of God, you understand he's sovereign, he's able to do all things. That's what you need to know this morning, amen? So I pray that God reminds you this when you need it the most, when you're in a situation. May the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance what we've been taught, amen? Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your living word. We thank you uh, for all of our internet listeners. I just pray blessing upon blessing on them beyond their imagination. I really do. From my heart, I pray that for you. And uh, God bless you. And love you guys. You don't have to leave right away. I'm here for prayer if you want. Um, Take some time. I don't know. Is there any bread downstairs for you guys? We can pick through some stuff and take home what you want warm up the cars give them a chance to warm up we can fellowship for a little bit but uh god bless you i love you and i'm glad you're here to hear this message amen